everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Players Experience Podcast. On this week's episode, we chat with Raptors reporter and 905 host, Savannah Hamilton, on her career and her journey through sport, what it was like to play at Ryerson Wild, going through sport media and suffering and injury in the process, what it was like to be mentored through um, the, her career and some guidance to get her to where she is today and her work that she's been putting in with the Raptors uh, each and every week with highlights and their own pod- podcast and content creations and making her story really come alive with women in sport and how she's made an impact in basketball. Before we bring Savannah onto the show, we of course would like to give a shout out to our uh, production team, Jay Salty Photography and Vic Mar Productions on the work that they do with the episodes each and every week, including the images that you guys see on our Instagram channel. Also want to give out a shout out to our merch producers, 19 Marketing. So guys, if you haven't got your merch yet, make sure to hit us up uh, so you can properly represent the brand everywhere you go. Um, if you haven't already done so as well, we have the Players Experience code to use with Hush Blankets, the Jaywalking Great North Apparel to use some discount codes on that great, uh, those great products. And also too, guys, if you haven't done it already, really, what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button now to uh, join, subscribe to the YouTube channel so you guys don't miss any new and exciting content that comes out each and every week. As again, we continue to chat with pro athletes, sport reporters, and individuals in sport about their work, their careers, and of course, their favorite experiences. Now, without further ado, let's bring Savannah Hamilton onto the show and start talking about her Raptors career and what her thoughts were around Kyle Lowry staying with the Raptors. Hey, Savannah, how's it going? Good. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been an insane run with the Raptors right now. We're going to get into it. But how have you been doing with like with work, with the pandemic, with like everything mixed in? Man. It's a good question off the top of the show. Um, you know, I am good. I, I'm, I'm so fortunate to be in the position that I am to, to be working throughout the pandemic and to be covering a sport that I love with a team that I love. Um, so I really can't complain much that way. I, I will say I am a bit tired. I won't lie. Like I, I am a bit, I'm feeling it. It's been a lot past a month and a half. Just, you know, the 905 season was very condensed. Um, so it was a lot to, you know, research and get to know the players and pull the stories, but it was such a, such a fun process. So, but yeah, so I, I'm good. I, that's my long way of saying I'm good. How are you? Oh, great. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, same kind of boat. Work's been crazy with virtual events and things like that. And just uh, keeping up with the podcast each and every week. Uh, we just passed 50 episodes last week, which was insane. Congrats. Um, and thank you so much for, for what was really a podcast that I thought was just going to be like a couple month thing. And here we are a year later. It's, it's insane to think like what has happened in the past year and where we are, right? Exactly. So. Yeah, the world's changed a lot. And the need for content is at its highest. And here you are providing it. Yeah, well, hey, I kudos to you because from one kind of content created to another, like your work has been amazing and uh, and been really fun to watch, especially the segments that you do with Jonesy and Sherman Hamilton as well. Thank um, you. Yeah, they've been great to watch. So kudos to you. Um, so I, I like to start off every uh, segment or every interview with an icebreaker rapid fire questions. Okay. So I'm four questions right off the hop and just first thing that comes to mind, just spit them out. So favorite time of day? Night. Strangest thing in your fridge? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, a smoothie that I have yet to drink. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, TV show you're currently watching? Oh, that's a, oh, I just finished, finished, um, Ginny and Georgia. So now I'm, now I'm on the lookout for, for more shows to watch. Yo, I just finished season five of Superstore. So if you haven't watched that, it's, uh, it's an interesting show. I watched 
the first episode and I wasn't, but you know what? Never watch the first episode and just stop. Like you got to watch at least three. So I, I watched the first Suits. one and I was like, eh. Yeah, I did that with Suits and I was like, at first I was like, ah, this is boring. Six months later, I binge watched the entire series. So. Okay, okay. So I'll give Superstar another chance. Yeah. And uh, okay. what would be a sport you'd want to compete in outside of basketball? Volleyball. Volleyball? Okay. All right. Yeah. Cool. So that's where my first question leads into. Where did the passion for basketball come for you? Um, pretty much born into it. Uh, it's funny. It's interesting because uh, I have a, a kind of an extensive basketball family with both of my aunts playing basketball professionally. I had an aunt that played on the national team. She was also involved with the WNBA when it first came out. Um, and I have, um, you know, my dad played at university, uh, Brandon University as well. And so when I, time I arrived, it was like, yeah, so you're playing basketball. Um, so, but it's kind of interesting that way because when you're kind of born into a, a, a family that, you know, has, has played a sport, you kind of have to find your own reasons and your own passion to play it for yourself. And that came for me probably later on in high school. So that, that was something that, uh, yeah, I worked on and, and, and it just start, started to be fun. You know, winning is fun. <laughs> so being out of a family of, out of basketball, please tell me, were you guys one of the families that like, when it's like, here's your one month baby picture and there's a basketball sitting right beside yep. you? Yep, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I have, um, I think I actually posted on my Instagram, there was actually me wearing like a, a Raptors t-shirt and I'm thinking like I'm maybe two, maybe three years old. And I was just like, yeah. And like my dad would literally sit me and my twin sister like beside each other and just watch the basketball game, like whatever Raptors game. We had no clue what was going on, obviously. But we're like, just like, okay, yeah, there's men moving on the screen. Okay, cool. A little did it, would we know that like eventually like we'd realize that, oh yeah, that's Tracy McGrady. That's Vince Carter. Those are the early days of the Raptors. So yeah, for sure. Incredible. Now, you went to school at Ryerson for sport media, and while you were there, you competed in basketball. Unfortunately, the injury bug got to you and, and had to uh, cut your season short, but you still made an impact and were and developed more of a love for basketball uh, growing up again, like you said, through high school and then through uh, at Ryerson. What was it like to play while attending school and trying to make a career for yourself, both on the court and off the court in sport media? Yeah, I mean, you, you said it right there. Um, getting injured in university was devastating to me, uh, as it is to like a lot of student athletes who are very serious about their sport. You know, I had a whole plan in my head. I was like, yeah, I want to play in university. I want to play professional afterwards. I want to try out for Team Canada, hopefully see where that takes me. And then, you know, the sky's the limit. I had big aspirations as a player. Um, and so, you know, having a pretty bad knee injury in your first year of university, um, just a few months in and think things were going well too. Like they're up on the upswing when I got injured, um, that like, it, it kind of like shook me, it shook me like completely. I had like, okay, well, what's my plan now? <laughs> um, had to check myself. And so in the meantime, when I was busy, like doing some like deep self-reflection and asking what is life, I had, I, I kind of found basketball again but from a different angle. And maybe it came also from the fact because I was sidelined, I saw a lot of different things on the court that was going on and I still wanted to support my teammates. But I feel like that maybe have translated now to like, well, communicating the game. And maybe that led more into media. And I was already taking sport media, so I already had um, a, a pull towards it. And I, I knew that like, when I went to Ryerson, I chose Ryerson because of the program too, that um, – that I eventually did want to work in the media, but I didn't know when. I didn't know like how that was going to happen before I got injured. And then like it, during my injury, I was like, okay, well, instead of me being salty and on the sidelines, me, let me just invest myself that much more into my um, my program and what I'm doing and what I want to complete, um, because you know that's going to keep me focused and, to be quite honest with you, keep me from being completely depressed. Okay. And uh, yeah, I, I feel that because I like myself, I play baseball and basketball with the Special Olympics and, and I've had some injuries, not been not enough to sideline me, but I, I definitely understand the passion for wanting to be on the court and, and sitting on the sidelines is, is just, it, it's heartbreaking, really. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, 
as we know, as we both know, we, uh, my colleague Javid is the one that put us in touch. Uh, have you ever seen, like, being a baller yourself and Javid's a baller, I'm a baller, have you seen Javid play ball before? I have not, but just on that note real quick, I have to say to Javid, thanks for connecting you and I, but then also my colleague, Dwayne, he gives a shout out to Javid as well. He's like, yo, tell Javid I say hi. So <laughs> Dwayne says hi, Javid, if you're listening. Oh, he, uh, he definitely will be. I'll make sure he, he told me like once we're done this interview, like to let him know when it's up so that he can watch it for sure. Okay, but, good. Uh, the reason I asked that was because I was hoping you'd be able to see Javid play, but I was going to say, in the game of 21, who do you think, like, I'm 6'6", six, six, Javid's, I think, 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. Um, who do you, but, like, height doesn't really matter in 21, but, like, who do you think would win in a game of 21 between the three of us? I mean, would you even be a player if you didn't say yourself? Like, of course I'm going to say myself. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, simple as that. <laughs> uh, COVID ads, we'll, we'll rage in. And Let's go, all three of us. Out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're all going to be in COVID shape, so it's going to be great. <laughs> that's it. That's it. <laughs> you know, well, well, we're going to talk about your relationship with the Keel Augustine uh, in a short bit, but we'll get him in the mix as well. I'll get like a little Trini going. So okay, okay, awesome. <laughs> Now, in 2015, you started your work with MRC as an assistant director, and you are now uh, a host and producer for the Raptors, reporting on all things Raptors and all things Toronto around the team. What has it been like for you to work and putting the determination throughout the years? Um, and what has been one of your biggest motivators to get to where you are today? Oh, man. Um, it's interesting because, you know, I, I feel like whenever – you listen to somebody's like, how did you get on air story? It's never the same. Everybody has like such unconventional stories. And I feel like mine is no different. Um, you know, as you mentioned, like starting off behind the scenes, uh, I was with the hangout and, you know, Medicul, he brought me in. Uh, Dwayne completely took me under his wing and like just mentored me from the jump. Uh, and really, I ought to be quite honest, I, I sat and I just listened. Like, I didn't really even say much. I was just so happy to be there. I was just like, I'm not going to say a word. I'm just going to sit in this corner and like take notes in this, like, like you know, and I'm not going to disturb. Like, they, they're having a meeting. And then, and then eventually, like, Dwayne, I remember, like, I think a couple of weeks in to that, Dwayne, like, turned to me and was like, what do you think? And like, I said, like, something. I don't even remember what I said. It was, it was like an NBA type question. Like, what do you think about this? And I was like, well, I think that. And then next, you know, he's like, oh, like that was a really good thought or like that. And then in that ended up like changing a conversation. And so, and that's, a, and then, and I was just like, okay, that's my two cents. I'm being back, back to being quiet again. <laughs> I don't want to ruin it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so, yeah, so that's actually like how it really started. And then, but with more encouragement and, and development, like Dwayne just completely helped me develop my own voice. And, and by the time I was done with the hangout, um, like I was just as loud as they were in the meetings. I mean, don't, and don't get me wrong. Dwayne and Akil, they are very loud in meetings. Like they will, like, I don't want to say fight each other, but they will make sure their point is heard. And so I'm a bit more um, finessed, <laughs> but I'm not, a, I'm not scared to speak up. Uh, I think that's the, I think that was the key. Like I, I definitely developed confidence through them. Um, and they empowered me to find my voice that way as, as well. And so going from that to assistant directing, um, assistant directing kind of came in because honestly, I was just an extra body around the studio and people knew that I was just being a, like a writer. Um, not really, they didn't really, I don't even know if people really knew what I was doing, to be honest. Like, that, it's like I was just around. They're like, oh, she's around. And then somebody asked me if I knew how to do math and I lied and I said, yes. <laughs> and that, that lie has paid off <laughs> hey, the way the, the the same goes fake it till you make it exactly so yeah and then um got picked up to uh to actually work on the leaf side do a leafs post game show and yeah like i was rough like everyone's rough but th the great thing is that you really don't learn until you get thrown into the fire and i got the hang of ading and assistant directing and it paid off right away because once I told my professors back at school, because I was still in university when all this was happening, um, they were like, you know, very happy. And that actually brought me to CBC because CBC was then looking for assistant directors, but they called them associate directors there. And um, that actually was like my first kind of real, quote unquote real job as a freelancer in the media. So um, it, it, yeah, CBC paid my bills there for a while. 
um, as well, along with um, Tangerine. But it's interesting how everything unfolds itself. Because then when the on-air opportunity came up, that was through a Tangerine uh, event that I was actually covering through social media because I was running Tangerine social media. And I was talking to a producer that I've seen a few times around MLSC. Um, you know, when I have my hangout meetings, like I've seen her here and there, but I really didn't, didn't know her that well. But um, it was enough to say hi to her at the event. And I did. And um, she, she was just, she ran past this idea that she had uh, to like do a potential digital series and I was like oh my goodness I've been saying this for years and blah 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 and so me and her are like kind of collaborating and I was never shy to say like at any point in my career I was never shy to tell people that I want to be on air and I feel like that's like always the common theme between a lot of people who do uh who end up making it on air is that you know you, you have to let people know because no one's going to really like ask you per se unless you tell them so, uh, yeah, so, and then, and then once me and Tony kind of, and her name is Tony Francis, um, once me and Tony uh, kind of like collaborated on this digital series and she worked very ha like hand in hand with me on, on the reporting end of it, um, we, she really helped me develop uh, on air and uh, yeah, and then the rest was kind of history and then it just kind of takes off from there. You start doing well, you make the most of your opportunities and, you know, more opportunities come. That's incredible. And yeah, the opportunities definitely have come your way and it's been great because uh, like I was saying earlier, the work that you do with uh, Jonesy and Sherman Hamilton on all the Raptor post games and pregames and everything, all that works fantastic. And it's so uh, refreshing to just see like uh, women in sport first off um, and younger folks in media and knowing just as much as the veterans know really and, and being able to, to, used your voice and being able to um and highlight like everything around basketball and uh you've done a fantastic job with it so kudos for that thank you very much i really appreciate that and yeah jonesy and sherm i feel like they're i just i'm a sponge with them uh i have like such an opportunity and like the pleasure of working alongside them that like i feel almost again like i still have a voice i definitely have my voice now and then that's not going nowhere but i i'm just also, I just love to listen. I love listening to their stories and, and the basketball of the past, really, um, and put my two cents in where I can uh, as to what I see currently on the court. And, you know, the beautiful thing about the game is that it's like a universal language. So as long as you can talk game, you can talk game. Exactly. Now, talking about voices, as you mentioned, Akil has a very loud voice. He's been yeah. <laughs> especially during those Raptors uh, pump-up parties during the playoffs pre-COVID and hopefully after COVID and everything. Um, yeah, he, he's a man of uh, very loud voices. And when you were at Ryerson, you got to chat with uh, Akil and you chatted with him about loving his work and saying that you wanted to do what he does one day. What was the experience like for you to now be working alongside Akil and chatting about basketball and, and creating content with him? Well, first of all, shout out to you for doing your research. You really researched me. <laughs> hey, do it, you know? I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so working with Akil, uh, like, it's interesting because um, it's been fantastic. Um, the the initial he's because he's so loud and he's a huge character really like uh it, he can be sometimes intimidating to to approach so i literally just had to like ooh, approach him like okay and then like uh, like it's it's weird when you're networking i'll say this to anybody like almost you should have like yourself and who you are of course but then if you're that shy kid if you're really really nervous almost have a persona of yourself but the extroverted version and like, just like, just put it on, you know, like if you're in an event, just like, no, like we're parking the shy, the shy side of me away and we're bringing out the extroverted side over here. We're just going to pretend like we own the room, like that, like doesn't matter. You say hi to the loudest person. And so that's how I approached him. And like, I was on crutches. So I was like crutching over <laughs> to him because I was still injured. <laughs> um, and I just like, you know, I was like, hi, Akia. And like the first thing I, I needed to say, I was like, I just love your work. Um, and so, yeah, so, so then going from that and to getting to work with him, I really got to see up close uh, just, like, how talented he is. Oh, my goodness. Even to this day, like, I'm so amazed. And, and to this day, I, I, I hit him up for tips and, and hey, Kiel, how do you do this? How, how are you able to, to make this flow better? Um, 
you know, what examples, what practices do you do? And he's told me like, Hey, take an improv class. Um, try this, do this, da, da, da. Um, take note of how you're talking. And he's just giving me so much tips and tricks that, you know, maybe you wouldn't have thought of, or they don't really teach you in school unless you're in the fire. Um, so he's so, so working alongside him has been great. I've been able to really ob- observe his style and how he goes about his work and his big personality um, and take the best out qualities and, and what he's taught me and, and kind of implement it into my own voice. That's huge. And yeah, shout out to Akil because it's funny. I actually, I had Akil on an episode a few months back and um, believe it or not, like, I, as I mentioned, I was Special Olympics and um, I kind of got my starting sport back in 2006. But before that, like the first couple of years of high school, I was that quiet kid in, in the corner, like just hanging out with a couple of my buddies, like not really doing much, not saying much. And like Akil even attested and said, like he's known me for a number of years through the Raptors. Like I used to work at MLSC as uh, as the gate staff, so we knew each other there. And uh, so he's known me for a while. And then he's like, yeah, you really like, who knew that like you'd be running a podcast one day? Because like, but here we are. And uh, yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, your voice is everything in sport. And and uh yeah that's actually some really good tips and tricks that i'm gonna steal from you now because going to, and checking out improv like i wouldn't have thought of that because you're right unless they teach it in school like you wouldn't know yeah absolutely yeah it's it's it makes you think on your feet and like i've i've been fortunate enough to take a few improv classes now and like it really tests it <laughs> it tests you so much like things that you've never had to think of like you know all of a sudden you got to think of them and the, the whole like yes and exercise that a lot of improv, improv, yeah, improvisation you have to do. Yeah. Um, it really challenges you to think a bit faster and differently as well. Also, I'm so like not distracted, but I'm I'm impressed with how like your background is. Like, who I know people. This is a podcast. People are listening, but your background is phenomenal. Thank you. And then this actually goes on YouTube as well, so people actually can see the pod or the background. As okay, well. good. I was gonna <laughs> say it deserves all the shine. Yeah, thank you. And this is just like a small attribute of the amount of stuff that I have <laughs> in the basement. I'm not even kidding you. Like, I'll show you after, but like, it's insane. Um, but like, God rep my boy, Kobe, you know, watch Absolutely. Kobe was like my go-to guy growing up and watching him alongside Vince Carter, obviously being a Toronto fan, Vince Carter was number one, but Kobe was number two. And um, and then, yeah, Alomar was uh, up there as well. So Very nice. Ah, I love it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, now, I want to chat Raptors, obviously, uh, with you now. I want to get some thoughts a bit on the trade deadline just around Lowry. The trade line just passed a week ago, and while Toronto did lose a few names, including Norman Powell, the biggest player question was Lowry. Are we going to trade him? Are we going to keep him? What the hell are we doing with Lowry? And sure enough, he ended up sticking around with the six and with the Raptors. What's your take on Larry sticking around with the Raptors, considering that his name is being tossed as, uh, what's it being called? The Groat, the greatest Raptor of all time. Man. Well, huh. first of all, like you said it earlier, you know, we did lose a few names in the trade deadline, and that's just the business of basketball happening right there. But, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of all the accompli- accomplishments that Norm has you know, provided this team, he, he's a big reason why we have a championship too. So, you know, as sad as it is to, to see him move on, uh, he's also in a really great situation with Portland now. So I'm excited for him there. Um, and same thing goes for Matt Thomas and Terrence Davis. Like they're phenomenal players. And so, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how they grow in this league. Um, and as for Lowry, man, what a sigh of relief. I was just, I think all Raptors fans were feeling the same thing. As much as we know that the summer is could be a whole different ballpark and um, you know, he could easily decide maybe to go elsewhere in, in the future. But as of right now, we're gonna, just gonna savor every moment that we still have the growth. And yeah, I, I think we're all just like, okay, good. And also, you know, like the way that the team was playing this past month, they're affected by COVID and following league health and safety protocols as 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 Fred Van Vliet. Um, you know, expressed him, his, his own personal um, self and how, what he was going through. Um, and so like, because the team wasn't performing as well as they normally do, I don't think any Raptors fan really wanted Kyle Lowry to go on that note. So now we get to see him, you know, at least at the very least finish up the season with us. Um, 
And, and yeah, absolutely. Like, there's no doubt in my mind that he is the greatest Raptor of all time. And look at all the records he broke this past season. I know, like, it's insane. I have to, like, remember them all, but we've talked about them all on, like, Raptors today, like, most charges. Um, I think it's the most – is he the most assists now? I think he is the most assists. I think um, most assists, yeah. Yeah, second in scoring for the Raptors, right under his, his buddy DeMar. So, um, yeah, he's just been, a, like, a tremendous leader, and it feels like every single week I'm talking about a record that he broke. And so – and not to mention also big reason part of the championship run as well. So – I think I think as a Raptors fan myself, as I know I cover the team, but still, still the very heart. I was thinking about this actually the other day. Like, when did I become like a Raptors fan myself? The same, the same reason. Like, you know, how did I find my own passion for basketball? When did I really become a Raptors fan? Like, I've always followed the team, but when did I become like dedicated into them? And like that, Kyle Lowry was the player that did it for me. That's incredible. I know for me, like. I want to say, like, Jose Calderon and DeMar DeRozan, like, that kind of era. Mm-hmm. But there hasn't really been, for me, like, a true player. I guess I'm, I'm with you on Lowry because of all the accomplishments that he's, he's said and he's broken and, and things like that. And who knows, by the end of uh, – I don't know the exact number right now, but, like, for the number of points between him and DeMar, I don't know if it's close enough where he might break it before the year's up. But if he sticks around, then he's certainly going to break DeMar's record for that. Exactly. Oh, so, I mean, hey, he puts in the work. And, like, I remember uh, after playoffs a couple of years ago when there was, like, video – it was either playoffs or after a regulation game. And you saw him, like, just putting in work by himself on the court. It's like you need that drive and that determination on a team. And yep. even though, like, you have got – like, with Larry, if he has struggles during the playoffs, you have an entire team to pick him up. So, yep. you like, there's no winning in, in team unless you're Kobe Bryant and you say there's a <laughs> in that. But, uh, oh, I mean, oh, man. hey, like, yeah, that's how it works. It, it's so great to see how much – yeah dedication he's putting to sport and giving back to Toronto as well Mm -hmm. now since we're approaching the end of the season we're just a couple months away from the playoffs which is again insane to think about considering everything that's been happening with COVID and and the protocols and and how pretty much unscathed the Raptors have had until up to recently what do you think the Raptors need to do to stay a contender and to ultimately make the playoffs and and compete in them I think they need to do exactly what they did Wednesday night <laughs> against Denver. Yeah. Uh, we've seen this team perform, man. Like we, before they got hit by, by COVID and had to follow the league health and safety protocols, uh, you know, we, we saw a great team in February. Um, you know, obviously Norm, Norm is no longer with us, but um, we saw so much out of Siakam again. We saw OG step up. Lowry was leading like Lowry does. He's doing what Lowry does. Um, and, and, and we saw, you know, Chris Boucher, what a player, man. And so we still have a, a big core of this team together that was performing. Don't forget, this team beat the Bucks and they beat the Jazz. So they have it in them. They truly, truly do. Um, it's just a matter of just stringing those games in a consistent matter. Uh, it would be great. You know, we, we should see consistency from – from every single player on a, every a, a given night. Um, however, you know, I would, I would expect it the most from our leaders, which I do look at Lowry. I do look at Pascal. Um, and I do think there's room for OG to, to step in there as well. But, you know, what I really appreciate about OG's game is the fact that he is, he's a quiet contributor. Like, sometimes he has big nights where, you know, it's pretty like the, the, the box score says a lot. But there's other nights where, uh, like Wednesday night even, um, where the box score is not – beaming at you but you know he's he's doing hustle plays or he's getting rebounds and things that and just making the smart extra pass or kicking it and or driving and then kicking it stuff like that like he does a lot of little things as well that he brings to the table so um looking forward to to seeing all that come together because I do believe that now that the losing streak is snapped we should be good to go. I'm going to cross my fingers on that one. So, not all the wood. Yeah, yeah. They all come out of the woods. And I think – and I was, I was telling a colleague of mine, I can't remember who now, but I was telling one of my colleagues, I'm like, I, if, I, if I was entering the playoffs and I was the number one seed and Raptors were number eight, I would hate to play the Raptors in the first round. If the Raptors – if like I think the 76ers – I got to double-check that, but last time I checked, 76ers were number one in the East. 
And um, yeah, and I was thinking, could you imagine a Sixers Raptors first round? Are they still number one? Do they got I'm no- looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. One sec, my phone's slow as um, <laughs> the Sixers are in two games up on the Bucks and the Nets because the Bucks and Nets are uh, tied at two games apiece. Okay, so wait, so they, so they are so they're third now. No, the the seventy sixers are first, and then the, it goes the Bucks and the Nets. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so the seventy sixers stay number one. Yeah, I w- I would not want to uh, play the Raptors as my first round. That's for sure. Yeah, it uh, you'll get a Joel Embiid flying home rather than flying to the playoffs real quick. Something like that, exactly. Now, talking about teams and and your work with the Raptors and, as I mentioned earlier, with women in sport, I wanted to talk about something that TSN hosted last Wednesday that was truly an incredible uh, f- feature and, and support for women in sport. They hosted an all-women's broadcast covering the Raptors and Nuggets matchup with um, – Kate Burness on anchor, Kayla Gray reporting. I can't, I'm sorry, but I'm blanking on all the women in sport that were on it. I got Uh, you. There were so many great women reporting. How thrilled were you to be a part of that and witness her story go down? And how do you think that will impact uh, women in sport in the near future? I was going to say, like, did you say her story or history? Oh, I caught Uh, that. I I I caught that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very nice, very nice. Yeah, I think um, for first of all, this, just to say their names is Kia Nurse, Kayla Gray, Amy Otterbert, Kate Burness, uh, and Megan McPeak, and they're all phenomenal. And I was very impressed that Lowry uh, in the post game presser gave them all a shout out as well. Um, it's so impactful to the next generation, to me, to current, to older generations. It goes so beyond, um, you know, just the one night that that we had the broadcast and. Um, before we get into to the broadcast itself, what I, you know, I was having a conversation earlier today and, and somebody was telling me that you know, their sons were watching and their sons were like, okay, like, I get that this is all one's broadcast, but this feels like a normal game. Like, this is just like, yeah, yeah. it's like, yeah, they're, they're calling the game. Cool. Like, it was normal. And I was like, that's what I love to hear. Like, it, for, for, for young men, for young women to not think of it as, Ooh, this is way different. Like, of course it's different, but like for younger people who may not take in the significance of it yet, just to think that it's, it's completely normal. Oh yeah. This doesn't seem like it's like out of the ordinary or so like random. Um, and so that, that I really appreciate that. So I think that's like the message that got through. And even if it's a subconscious one for, for young girls, especially to see, um, and, you know, Kate Burness did such a great job in her intro of, like, just making it known that, listen, if you're a young, a young woman, a girl watching this, that, you're like, you know, anything, anything's possible. You can do it. Um, even if it subliminally kind of sinks into their head, seeing is truly believing. At least they saw it so they know it's an option that they've seen somebody who looks like them, um, you know, at in a broadcast holding space and not just in the traditional roles of sideline reporter or host, but also analyst, also play by play and color. Um, I think that's so important because I think about my own childhood and I didn't get to see any Canadian women really do that. Like there was always the asylum reporter, but in, in terms of play by playing color as, as Kia nurse and Megan McPeak did so well, um, that was a foreign concept to me. Uh, and, and it's interesting because, you know, I look back and think about the women who have influenced my career and the only people I can really think of per se, like when I was in my teenage years was, um, in, uh, American women like Sage Steel, uh, you know she she's one of the first people that comes to mind that way. Uh, so so the impact of the broadcast is is tremendous, and I don't as much as people may not you know understand it right now. If you're like maybe a teenager or or, or a young girl or a boy, um, it'll come back to you. You won't even realize it. You'll think of it later. Um, and then yeah, and then going to the broadcast itself. I I know all of the women. They're tremendous. They are so qualified and capable, as we saw on Wednesday night. Uh, and I'm just happy that they executed at the highest fashion, considering, listen, it's hard to do a broadcast no matter what number of broadcasts it is. But, you know, and even though all of them have done broadcasts in the past, um, to, to do it with a new crew, to do any slight changes, it, it's a hard thing to do. So it was almost like a double task in the fact that, like, not only are they calling an NBA game, it's something that, you know, they haven't done before on a technical standpoint of, 
um, you know, like working with another, a new person, um, somebody that you haven't worked with before directly, maybe, or as close on a full broadcast. And they were obviously trained um, prior to, but it, it just goes to speak to the volume of talent that they really had in the fact that, you know, you, you couldn't really tell. You can, you can really tell that, you know, this was their first time working together. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. And it, it's great too, because Kate and Vanessa and I actually have history together. Oh, um, yeah. I used to work at Rogers TV out in Oshawa and she, did, she started working with Rogers TV out there. So we worked a lot. Uh, together um, back in the day and like this was going back geez like 2010 so like 11 years ago so uh, yeah it's been great to see her grow and, and do the work that she's been doing now too so like you gave a shout out to Javid I gotta give a shout out to my girl Kate to for, hey uh, for all the work that she's been Kate's doing. fantastic I've had the pleasure of like having a conversation with her uh, more so recently and um, she really Helped me. She gave me some solid tips on sideline reporting for when I covered the 905. So she deserves all the flowers and all the shout outs that she can get. That's awesome. Now I have just a couple more questions for you. Since you're covering um, the Raptors and since your start with the team and the 905 and everything, what's been your favorite uh, experience covering the team so far? Um, and what has been, I'm going to say outside of Larry, who's been one player you've enjoyed watching or covering the most? Ooh, that's a good question. Outside of Larry. Hmm. Man, like there's just so many. Like I want to almost like, you know, I, I when Serge was here, I really enjoyed covering him and watching his personality shine alongside OGs. I feel like they really complimented each other and like their little like rivalry, but like not really, but like the scarf and everything. Um on a player standpoint, though, you know, I feel like, man, just watching all the 905 players just come up through the system, like, that's really inspiring to me to see how they've developed and see how this Raptors organization works as a whole as well. Like, you know, Norm and, and Pascal and Fred, um, you know, Boucher, we've seen them all come up through our system. And so I can't, it's hard to choose between any of them. Maybe Fred, maybe I'll say Fred because he did make an NBA record this past season. And so, you know, he was definitely one of those, you know, un undrafted players, um, developed the 905, got a 905 championship, and then later on brought a championship to Toronto. And he's so iconic with his, like, the blood <laughs> cut, it, cut underneath his eye and, like, his, like, iconic yell, yell in, like, the, the finals as well. Um, so he just plays with so much passion. And I know, like, the Freddie – uh, a fan base is <laughs> is really hardcore with them, um, so so I really appreciate his game and and how far he's come and just like the the tone he set and just you know he he is almost like a Kyle Lowry 2.0 but he does have his own style at the same time so I appreciate watching him but uh, man all the 905 players they just make you so proud. That's great and um, yeah you know what it's, it's funny that you say uh, Van Fleet because. Now that he's actually, like, his story of, yeah, being undrafted, going through the Raptors 905, I keep forgetting how historic and, and iconic his story is. So, for me, I'm going to actually choose – I'm going to go back, backtrack a bit, and pick Freddie as my uh, my player because, uh, yeah, he – like, his – yeah, just his whole story has been so unique. And then the fact that he signed a six-year deal earlier this year – um was yep. just like the the cherry on top rather so you know he's going to be around for a while so yeah yeah I feel like um Toronto does a great job of just making a home for these players as well as not just like on the court but just making them feel comfortable that they want to stick around as well so uh yeah that's a he's such a great pick he is a great pick now, I like to end off every uh, interview I do, or every chat rather, uh, with a segment I call Words of Wisdom. So what would your words of wisdom or advice be for the next generation of uh, broadcasters, women in sport that want to make a name for themselves uh, in and make a career? Get comfortable with being uncomfortable um, and don't be afraid to truly use your voice and it takes time to find it for sure, but um, you do have one in you. And, you know, especially with to, to younger women, I think of 
you know, at times you're going to be the only woman in the room. If you're a BIPOC person, at times you're only going to be the only BIPOC person in the room, but don't let them, don't let that stop you from, from really, you know, having your say and, and don't feel less than, or don't hide yourself to, to, you know, there's, there's room at the table for you. And as long as you obviously use your voice to, to let other people know that you, you ain't playing games. So, um, yeah, just, and just keep your head up, keep your head up and stay stubborn. Awesome. Savannah, thank you so much for taking the time, um, to be on the show, share your experiences through your journey, uh, into the Raptors and into sport media. We really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, all the best for you in your career, and and hopefully uh, you'll you'll get a second Raptors championship ring uh, sooner rather than later. Yeah, yeah, we need another one, man. We need another. I have my I have my cha- championship ring back here. Um, if I was supposed to move the camera over there, but um, man, we need another one. And thank you so much for for having me on the show. This is awesome. You're doing something great over here. I love it. Thank you so much. All right, we'll chat soon. No.